Christian minister, a doctor and his nurse who were literally fighting Ebola and the world didn't pay any attention in April as they were calling for help in May, in June, and July, and only in July 28th did anyone face it. But it was a person who cared because of faith and offered actually to go back, to go back because of his faith. Moreover, it is increasingly the case that Christians who find themselves marginalized, oppressed, and persecuted, in the truest sense of the word, in fact, author Alan Gursky notes that the suffering church, the suffering church, constitutes nearly a third of the total Christian population globally. Thus far, I've focused on the increasingly sinister challenge facing Christians and other religious minorities abroad, and the seeming disconnect between the mounting violence and the response of people of faith in the West. But this escalation in religious persecution is not merely a distant reality that can be tuned out with a click of a remote or a mouse. For religious freedom, I believe, is under assault domestically as well. It would be foolishness to su suggest that people of faith in America are experiencing even a modicum of the persecution described above. That said, despite the constitutional protections religious freedom has historically enjoyed, its sacred standing in the American experiment is daily being encroached upon. In describing the now notorious Elon photography case, author Eric McToxas, who wrote a great book on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, recently wrote, not long ago, a New Mexico Supreme Court justice told a Christian photographer and her husband who were charged with declining to photograph a same-sex event that they were, quote, compelled by law to compromise the very religious beliefs that inspire their lives, adding, it is the price of citizenship. The court's reasoning, if it can be called that, must be placed in the context of the broader culture. There's much that can be said on that score, but again, in the interest of time, I'll focus on one component, namely the elevation of tolerance as the premier virtue. For that question, there are merits to tolerance. But for tolerance is demanded when Orthodox Christianity is deemed intolerant, when government and even society fails to extend tolerance to people of faith, we are headed down a broad path. Strikingly, this is the very road we find ourselves traveling. But it begs the question that I hinted at in recounting the story of Pastor Bowl. Are we approaching a day when people of faith in America will be forced to choose between abiding by the dictates of their conscience and submitting to the law of the land? Considering such a proposition is no mere philosophical exercise. Increasingly, I am of the mind that people of faith, especially those in positions of authority, are going to face situations that are not simply culturally unpopular, but conceivably situations that force us to choose between God and Caesar. Colonel Francis George, former president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in 2010, predicted, quote, I expect to die in my bed, my successor will die in prison, and his successor will die in martyr in the public square. Is this alarmist? Unnecessarily dramatic? I pray so, but the evidence before us at least demands an examination on the prospect. Last June, Cardinal George wrote, this tendency for the government to claim for itself authority over all areas of human experience flows from the secularization of our culture. If God cannot be part of public life, and the state itself plays God. The last several decades, we have witnessed God being increasingly squeezed out of the public square. Our culture has indeed become more secular and coarsened as a result. Our founders understood that only a virtuous people could remain truly free. But in this area of growing secularism, virtue is mocked. Traditional vices are elevated in film, music, television, and public life. These corrosive realities, corrosive realities have devastated families and destroyed communities while slowly chipping away at our ability to live as free people who volitionally abide by the better angels of our nature rather than succumbing to our most base impulses. Enter the state whose laws, in my view, are increasingly out of step with moral law. One of the most powerful pieces of writing in modern times is Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. If you have not read the letter by Dr. King from the Birmingham jail, do it tomorrow. It is one of the most powerful things 
that you will ever read. He was in jail when he wrote it. In it, he explains with great eloquence and relevance, even for today, the difference between a just law and an unjust law, writing, quote, he said a just law is a man-made law, code that squares with the moral law, or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. King, of course, was speaking of the evil of segregation and other forms of state-sanctioned racial discrimination. But his clear thinking and Winston prose has applications still today. He reminded those who had ears to hear the following. He said, everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal. Everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. And suggested while it was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany, he was certainly, he would have done so had he lived during that time. King continues, I must honestly reiterate that I had been disappointed with the church. He said, when I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of bus protests in Montgomery, Alabama, a few years ago, I felt I would be supported by the white church. I felt the white ministers, the priests, and rabbis in the South would be among their strongest allies. Instead, he said, some have been outright opponents. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetized and security of staying class witness. Questions and courageous? Are we willing to risk imprisonment in the face of unjust laws? These are profound questions of conscience which every man and woman must answer for themselves. And I am of the mind that we in the West will find ourselves better able to count the cost, as it were, the more intimately acquainted we are with our persecuted brothers and sisters abroad. When Rabbi Saperstein got the Anne Frank Award with him was Canon White, who was the, the vicar of Baghdad, and you may not know David, he has had to leave as of several days ago. But when we know the stories of the people that are there that are going through the persecution, we, I think, learn. If we know their stories, if we weep at their wounds, do we intercede on their behalf through prayer and advocacy, I'm confident we will find ourselves shaped by the courage of these men and women as they become more than faceless and nameless victims in distant wars and hard to pronounce prison cells. And if we're clear eyed about the times in which we live, I believe these encounters will make our own faith more robust and strengthen us for the day to day. George Washington famously said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. The instincts and wisdom of our first president have been borne out empirically in recent years. A study by researchers at Georgetown University and Brigham Young University found that religious freedom is one of only three factors significantly associated with global economic strength. Research sponsored by the Pew Foundation revealed a positive correlation between religious freedom and other human goods, such as longevity and democracy. As what Marianne Glendon described as, quote, the presence of civil political liberty, women's advancement, press freedom, literacy, lower infant mortality, and economic freedom. In short, there is a compelling case to be made even in an increasingly secular context regarding the importance of protecting and elevating religious freedom. What remains to be seen is whether men and women of faith and others of goodwill will accept this challenge regardless of where it leads us. So, in ending, a couple points. Religious freedom should be and must be always bipartisan. Always bipartisan. I was some of my biggest help from some on the other side, and if you may remember, maybe you don't, Scoop Jackson and and, and, and Ronald Reagan, and you can remember Bill's on the floor would be Henry Hyde and Lantos, Lantos and Hyde. Religious freedom should always be bipartisan. Secondly, we need to make religious freedom one of the top issues one of the top five issues in 2016 elections for president, for Senate, for the House. Every candidate running 
should be expected and able to articulate their stance on this issue and how they and how they will protect religious freedom should they be elected. Dr. Martin Luther King, to quote to quote to the said, said, in the end we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood up to the Nazi government and was hung in Flossenburg State Prison literally a day or two before the artillery, the Western forces came in. You could hear they said the artillery, as he was being hung, said, silence? That's the word again, silence. Silence. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Not to speak, he said, is to speak. Not to act is to act. So I believe we should all commit ourselves that we will speak and then we will act. Thank you again.